Hello. Thank you. Uh, so my name again is Tom Townsend, and I'm, I'm pleased to be here. And I'm going to start with a question. Uh, the question is, isn't our history fixed? And uh, yes, yeah, so let's listen to uh, someone we know, Stanley Wells. So um, a great guy, right? So uh, in his curmudgeon style, he says, it is dangerous and immoral to question history, <laughs> right? Um, so he's telling us in his uh, angry what fashion that in fact, history is definitely fixed, definitely. But but wait a minute, he's been an English literature professor all his life. Shouldn't we be talking to, uh, no, historians? <laughs> what an idea, right? So uh, one historian has something different to say. History is always evolving. While well, another one says we must keep rewriting history. While well, a third tells us why. We must be open to new ideas and theories because new historical evidence is constantly becoming available, constantly becoming available. And of course, this impacts on the Shakespeare authorship issue as well. So, and in fact, virtually all of the historical evidence I'll be presenting is, is relatively new. So I've been studying the history of the Shakespeare era for 35 years. And I'm gonna start with the attitudes towards women in the Shakespeare era, first among commoners and referred to as commoners. Now in this hierarchical society in which the occupation of your father matters a great deal, it doesn't matter for women. Women are in a very low category, according to many historians, and in the same grouping as outlaws and what they termed idiots. We would call these people mentally challenged people. Uh, but these are all groups that they would have considered had little value to their society. So uh, let's go on to the nobility, which we'll see is astronomically different. So uh, it turns out that all of the nobility are literate and extremely well educated. I'm speaking about the men and the women and their servants. Thinking now about our Shakespeare, our Shakespeare himself is astronomically different than other poets and playwrights from his era. So for one thing, all of the plays, except for one, and the poems and the sonnets take place among the nobility. So of course, Shakespeare is showing us literate and extremely well-educated women. But more than that, Shakespeare shows us strong, uh, determined, uh, assertive women who are every bit the equal of men. He shows many men on stage, but he also shows many women on stage resolving the issue their story has given them on a completely equal basis. Shakespeare has more roles for women, and these are usually large roles, than all other playwrights from his era combined. One of the th other things that I find interesting is that noble women did perform the parts of women in Shakespeare's plays at Queen Elizabeth's court in the first part of her reign. Just as noblemen obviously performed the parts of men in Shakespeare's plays at Queen Elizabeth's court in the first part of her reign. And we'll come back to that uh, a little bit later. The question is, how did Shakespeare come to know or learn that men and women were completely equal? And I'll cover that also later on in the presentation. So we're taught very clearly, it can only be, only possibly be the Stratford man who is our author. I'm gonna be calling him, by the way, the Stratford man, at least for the time being. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, three key components of the Stratford man's known historical legacy, his occupation, his, uh, family life and his literary career, which is important. So going on to his occupation, we're gonna to listen to Jane Archer and her co-writers. These are professors and lecturer at Amherstwyth University in Wales in the UK. Uh, now I term all of these people traditional authorship advocates, which are English literature professors and others who are strident, vehement. It can only possibly be the Stratford man who is our author. So Jane Archer, the lead author, says the Stratford man had been a grain merchant for 15 years. Her sources are the Shakespeare Birth Dress Records Office, as well as the British National Archives. She says, and he hoarded grain during times of famine. Now, few of our English literature professors want us to know this, that he did hoard grain in 1598. But there's another complete group of academics called historical economists who studied the famines. They've said it's the grain merchants who are taking ownership of virtually all the grain that was available. And then they raise prices extremely high, which results in thousands of people dying of starvation. Now, Archer says this important information has been redacted from history by our English literature professors. 
And she has more to say. She says the strapping man was not adverse from profiting from what she calls the hunger business. She says with all the profits he gets from hoarding grain, this is how he's able to afford the second largest house in Stratford upon Avon, as well as pay those very expensive church tithes in Stratford upon Avon at the Holy Trinity Church to enable his entire family to be buried in the church altar for two generations. As well, Archer tells us, as a monument to himself, as a grain merchant, as drawn by William Dungdale in 1634. She further says this monument was not altered into the monument we see today where he's holding a pen and paper until the beginning of the 18th century. But we know more. We also know he buys the Blackfriars Gatehouse in London, and this is where Catholics said mass in secret. This also has been redacted from history by our English literature professors who don't want us to know that it was extraordinarily, extraordinarily likely that our Stratford man was in fact a Catholic, which brings us to a problem uh, of his authorship. Can the Stratford man really be a Catholic? There's other problems with the Stratford man. I'll come to those. So but here is Jonathan Bate, a strident traditionalist who says, uh, who congratulates Archer and her co writer for an excellent article. At a different time, he says the Stratford man um, had been a grain merchant, had been um, a part-time actor at the Globe Theater. I don't know how he knows that, but it, it doesn't matter because we can see he misses, Stratford Man misses a few seasons of the Globe Theater because we can see he's back in Stratford Bon Avon during the Globe season, buying and selling grain a few times and also going to court several times. Being a grain merchant is obviously a full-time job. So let's go on to his family life. Now, his two daughters, Suzanne and Judith, were illiterate. This, this doesn't make any sense with Shakespeare. Um, now, one traditionalist, uh, interestingly, has said, Tom, I don't think you get it. I, I don't think you get it because, Tom, here's the point. There's nothing for women to read. Come on, Tom. There's no public libraries. What's going on here? What about reading his plays? Why wouldn't he want them to, to read his plays? All he has to do is pay the local vicar three or four shillings to have his daughter's literacy. He doesn't do this. His will mentions no books, no manuscripts. In fact, there's nothing that shows any intellectual interest. Now, many scholars have said this uh, will is simply a businessman's will where all the properties and valuables are accounted for. So he gives his wife, Anne Hathaway, the second best bed. And traditionalists have made up phenomenal stories. What a wonderful guy this was, et cetera, et cetera. But in fact, uh, we know that at this time, well over 60% of commoners give their wives their primary residence and additional monies because they knew the difficulties widowhood would bring to their wives when they died. And they wanted to prepare their wives. Does this traffic man do this? No, not at all. So let's go on to his literary career. Well, here it is. It, it says so, Tom, right on the title page. It says so. William Shakespeare, that's all the proof you need. So says, again, our Stanley Wells and virtually 100% of our traditional authorship advocates. It says so, Tom. Are you getting this? <laughs> Except I, 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 I've been a researcher a long time, but I know this isn't how you determine authorship at all. I'll come back to that. But here's the other point. This society has no freedom of speech or freedom of press. But fortunately, we're not going to listen to me. We're going to listen to David Crezzi, who is a distinguished history professor at Ohio State University. And the area of, of his specialty is the Tudor monarchs and the Stuart monarchs, of which our Shakespeare era appears two thirds of the way through this. Crezzi says censorship in England at this time was part of the communications repertoire. Uh, and, and by the way, he provides evidence uh, for this. Many of our traditionalists don't believe there's any such thing as censorship in England at this time, interestingly, but I do. And I don't know what's been censored out or what's been censored in, which would be propaganda. So I need another source to confirm all of these poets and playwrights. And there is another source. We're gonna to listen to John Tosh to see why. Tosh is also a history professor at Roehampton University in London. And he's written a major textbook for history majors. He says, sources, carrying the most weight at this time are direct day-to-day -day evidence of thought and action provided by notes and letters and diaries and other personalized documents, which haven't gone through a censor, which are not propaganda, of course. 
Of course, now we have to categorize all these personalized documents into primary personalized documents and secondary. And there's a major difference because it's primary personalized documents that we need. This is where the writer of the document specifically knew the person of, the exact person of, in this case, the Stratford man, and knew that he had a literary career. Is that difficult to find? It's actually easy. We'll see that in a moment. And this is what was missing from that byline. We always have to know the exact author, the exact person. So taking in this on an easier level, level uh, we don't know if there are two or three William Shakespeare's running around or if there are two or three William Shakespeare's running around at this time. Are, are those two names similar or, or something? Is it an Alan M, a pseudonym? We have to know the exact author. That's not really asking for too much. So what's a, a secondary document? Well, it's the opposite. The writer doesn't know the Stratford man. Uh, so an example is William Shakespeare writes Romeo and Juliet. So all this person is doing is playing back that byline. The byline itself has no value. Stepping in in the very, very late 1990s is Diana Price, who herself is a traditional authorship advocate. She decided to, to search through many, many thousands of personalized documents, which would in some way show evidence of a literary career for all poets and playwrights from this era. So these are her categories. And all of these are primary personalized documents. What, what are her results? So, in fact, she finds evidence for all of the poets, all of the poets and playwrights from this era, except one. Except one. Now, the real name of the Stratford Man is not Shakespeare. Not Shakespeare. It's Shakespeare. Now, there's a good-sized Shakespeare family throughout England at this time, uh, including London. Uh, the origination of this name if comes from a French word, has nothing to do with shaking or spear. However, our English literature professors have redacted this name from history. The Stratford man's name is Shakespeare in their minds, and every one of his ancestors is also Shakespeare. Kind of cute. But here's the point. Here's my point. There are no primary personalized documents at all. None whatsoever for anyone at all with the name Shakespeare. Something critical, something vital is missing here. Price, of Diane Price herself, with this analysis, stops believing the Stratford man was Shakespeare. And she stops being an English literature professor as well. So this is why I call this man Shakespeare, because this is what he's trying to write out. Six signatures, all on legal documents. The last three are on his will. The by me William in the lower left here is in the same Henry as Francis Collins. Francis Collins, we know, is the town lawyer. And this has been recognized by the British National Archives, who have sees, sees a lot of his handwriting. So uh, uh, commonly, our traditionalists have told us that the Stratford man has writer's cramp. He writes like this, and he, he gets it because he's written, oh my goodness, so much in his life. <laughs> However, neurologists today say there's no such thing as writer's cramp. You can't give yourself uh, a, a malady or something uh, to create writer's cramp. However, we're going to just, I'm going to just pretend for a moment, just pretend he does have writer's cramp. Uh, what would we see? We would see uh, jittery signatures and personalization, jittery signatures and a personalization. We would see this signature after signature after signature. The point being, yes, there might be some jitteriness here, but the personalization would be obvious, obvious. It turns out all of these signatures are actually made by scribes on behalf of their client, the Stratford man, who's telling them, maybe not in a nice way, sign on my behalf and I'm illiterate or in some words like that. So the, the scribes are all making these. Scribes uh, are told to represent their client. And the client is, their client, the Stratford man, is illiterate. So they're, they're, do, they're doing something to indicate to people who come after them, like lawyers and judges, that this person is illiterate. And we can see that in the last three, which are made by Francis Collins, uh, he knows what to do. So here is uh, Jane Cox, head of Renaissance documents at the British National Archives. She has seen tens of thousands of signatures in her lifetime. She says, literate men, literate men of the 16th and 17th centuries develop personalized signatures, 
much as people do today. And it's unthinkable, unthinkable. Shakespeare did not. Now, neither she nor I or anyone else who's ever said this are saying that Shakespeare was illiterate, but it appears strongly the Strafford man was illiterate. This is yet another of these problems why the Strafford man is, could never be the author. What were the signatures like for other poets and playwrights from this era? And you can see they're all beautiful. So going on to, uh, to this, uh, I like this. Uh, each year we have two or three new biographies written of the Stratford Man and Shakespeare. And these are mostly written by our English literature professors. Of course, they've made tens of millions of dollars doing this. Here's just one of these people. This is Stephen Greenblatt. He is a humanities professor at uh, uh, Harvard. Yeah, he writes this book, Will in the World on the Left. And his note to readers at the beginning, he says, there are huge gaps in knowledge, in knowledge that make any biographical study of Shakespeare an exercise in speculation. In speculation, we know what speculation means. It's a theory without evidence or the definition from another university, and this is Cambridge University. It's simply guessing. It's simply guessing. And that's exactly what our traditionalists do. They simply guess. Recently found was the Stratford Man's Harold Rearns, but there's a remarkable element, or I think it's remarkable, because his occupation is listed as ye player, meaning an actor. It's not listed as poet and playwright. However, our traditionalists simply speculate, we already know what that means, that Ralph Brooke, who is a different Harold than the person who writes this out, inserted this derogatory comment because he doesn't like a few successful commoners. Uh, now, this is using old data for the current evidence. You can't, you can't do that, but never mind that for a moment. We know that at this time, Shakespeare is well known in his lifetime. And we'll, we'll see the evidence in a moment. Well, who else would know that? Well, Ralph, uh, well, Ralph Brooke is on the ground at this time, and he would be grateful. He could recognize and honor this great playwright and great poet and not be derogatory but only if, in fact, he were the author. Only if, in fact, he were the author. Because he doesn't do this. This is good proof that this man is not at all the author. And by the way, the lesser poet and playwright, Michael Drayton, receives a heraldry for poet and playwright, and he was a commoner from the Warwickshire area, the same area that, Stra that Stratford upon Avon is in. Now, is it possible, really, that William Shakespeare was a pseudonym? Uh, are you kidding me? What? S yes, scholars have said 16th and 17th centuries were the golden age of pseudonyms, and almost every writer uses a pseudonym at one time or other during their career. W why, why is that exactly? We re remember that list of poets and playwrights, and it turns out a third of these are tortured and are thrown into prison for what they had written. If they infer something even trivial about the nobility or trivial uh, about a political issue, They'll be tortured and or thrown into prison and some die. Our Shakespeare does both of these things a few times, but nothing befalls our Shakespeare. So a pseudonym explains why there's no primary personalized documents. We've already seen how important those are and why Shakespeare is not punished for his writings. Here's some examples of pseudonyms. Almost all the pseudonyms have hyphens in them, just like William Shake hyphen Spear. 45% of those title pages have hyphens in them. So let's go on to Thomas Vickers here. Thomas Vickers becomes a vicar, and we have to think about this. In this very religious society, vicars must be honest all the time. We'll see later on it's mandatory. On the other hand, every single thing he writes, his sermons, everything, must go through a censor. Now, the censor is scanning the document very quickly. So Vickers uh, receives an edu education in Greek and Latin with a master's degree in, from Oxford University. And he uh, writes a book, which includes a major chapter on the outstanding English poets, but doesn't include Shakespeare. But in his third edition, and this is a strategic move on his part, because uh, it's very likely in a third edition, this, this, the uh, censor is scanning even faster than normal. So he writes in Latin to these, I believe, should be added that well-known poet who takes his name from Shaking and Spear and then blithely continues on in the same sentence 
with his normal name formatting, John Davis this, John Vickers that. One traditionalist has said, Tom, this is pretty funny. He's punning the Strapper man's name. That's what he's doing. That's not what he's doing because he says elsewhere, he admires these poets. And what, what does he want to do? Well, of course he wants to tell us their names and with a first name and a last name. That's what you do when you tell someone someone's name. But how do you translate an English name at this time into Latin? Actually, it's very easy. You translate the first name and add a standardized suffix to the last name. That's it. That's the end of the story. So if we just pretend for a moment, just pretend, and I don't like to pretend, but he wants to tell us this to strap him in. He would have written Gillam the Shakespeare and been done with it in the first edition. But that's not what he does because a pseudonym does not follow the same formatting. But it can be put into its phonetic components and translated, which is exactly what he does. He's indicating quite clearly that's a pseudonym. Stepping in in 1920, my goodness, is Thomas Looney. Thomas Looney had been a Shakespeare teacher all of his life. He decides to compile a list of attributes the real Shakespeare would have based on his writings. And then he searches in history for someone who meets all of his criteria. And he finds the author as Edward De Vere, 17th Earl of Oxford. He's looking for a known writer, but for which nothing is available under his name. To me, this is also very important, a recognized genius in his lifetime. I'm, I'm hoping we all realize today that geniuses are made, they're not, they're not born, as I was taught when I was young. So to me, uh, this is also very important. Uh, enthusiasts for Italy, a third of Shakespeare's plays are set in Italy. So uh, the question is, does Shakespeare get everything right about Italy or everything wrong? And we'll come back to that. Enthusiasts for drama. My goodness, this is important. And in fact, we have this, the art of the English posy. There are notable gentlemen in the court who, in the court, who have written commendably and suffered it to be published without their own names to it. Of which number, of which number is first, meaning the most prominent, the foremost, that noble gentleman, Edward Earl of Oxford. What's he talking about here? This is about the Shakespeare plays that are at Queen Elizabeth's court. We already know that there are a number of Shakespeare plays that are being performed at Queen Elizabeth's court. And uh, these are written by Edward de Vere. He's making this point here. Now, these are plays that we, uh, we know, we, we see their titles. We know these are Shakespeare plays. This is way before the Stratford man even comes to town. And he's writing these plays. He's performing in these plays, part B. And that's important. Now, why can't he use his own name? So it has to do with this, the English version of Derogenus, which is a feudal law which says nobility cannot receive any monies, recognition whatsoever from, for any commercial venture. What happens if he says, well, I'm going to do it anyway? He would lose noble privileges. These are major, major privileges that nobility cannot afford to lose. This is related to something else called stigma of print. Nobility don't want to be known for doing something menial, like writing plays and poems. They are to serve the monarch. That's what they want to be known for. This is the highest calling anyone could ever have, to serve the monarch. But entertainments at Queen Elizabeth's and King James courts are very important. They can write, in my idle hours, which is a phrase that Shakespeare uses. So uh, today I'm going to present uh, nine excellent pieces of circumstantial evidence and one proof. But there aren't just nine. There aren't just 109. There's well over that. And as we know, there's more coming all the time. For traditionalists, they don't want us to know, but they only have two or three pieces of vague circumstantial evidence. So I'm going to start here with uh, De Vere's uh, education. He was taught by a, a foremost scholar right off the bat here. This is Sir Thomas Smith, uh, an expert in so many different languages and many academic subjects with his huge library. And he, uh, he goes through all of this stuff with, Sir, with uh, Edward De Vere here as a little boy. So Edward De Vere lives with Sir Thomas Smith and his wife in the Cambridge area from the age of four, and that's a very important age, to the age of 12, which is when his father dies. Then he becomes what's called a ward of the court, and he comes to live with William Cecil, the most powerful man throughout England by far. Now, 
Uh, he is uh, sympathetic. Cecil is sympathetic to the relatively new Puritan religion. And, and Puritans believe in many things which we sure do not believe in today. But one of the things they do believe in is the equality between men and women. So he runs his whole household in this way with his wife, Mildred Cecil. And he obviously indoctrinates his, his, his children and his wards with his, the importance of this equality. But one of Edward de Beers' major tutors was um, Arthur Golding, who was his uncle, who was a strident Puritan and has to teach religion to uh, de Vere. And he teaches it from a Puritan standpoint. Now, de Vere is taught by excellent scholars at this time, Lawrence Knoll and Arthur Golding. So um, Lawrence Knoll is a most outstanding scholar. He owns many rare Anglo-Saxon manuscripts. He owns the original copy of the epic tale, Beowulf, which today is studied in every college and university in the U.S., although it wasn't translated into English until uh, uh, 1837. So, but, but here's the point. The ending of Beowulf is the same ending we see in the play Hamlet. So Shakespeare absolutely has to have read Beowulf in its original Anglo-Saxon language, but also have access to it. And it was in the possession of Lawrence Knoll, his tutor. Scholars of the day used Cecil House as a meeting place, and the topic discussed was the Inkhorn controversy. All of these scholars are coming for dinner. Um, now, around the table are, are the scholars and Cecil and his complete family and his wards, which include Edward de Vere. The Inkhorn controversy is, how are we going to add new words to the English language? Uh, what are our sources for these going to be? Uh, uh, Greek, Latin, French, Anglo-Saxon, something else? Uh, at this time, a very high percentage of new words were actually added to the English language. What are our rules going to be for spelling, punctuation, and grammar? And I say all of this because our Shakespeare has a gigantic vocabulary, over 31,000 unique words, and he adds 25 to 35 new words to each play, poem, and sonnet. Now, Edward de Vere can write, and he does write when he's a young man, what we would call an academic article. Um, when he's still a young man, he says, new words should always be sourced from Anglo-Saxon words or early English words. So Italy here, so I'll touch on this. So Edward de Vere had an extensive 18 month tour of Italy, which features most of the cities. Uh, he goes to virtually all the cities that, that are featured in Shakespeare's plays. Richard Rowe writes this book in uh, 2011, Shakespeare's Guide to Italy. And he spends a lot of time in Italy, goes to archives and so forth. And he rediscovers long forgotten aspects of our Shakespeare's Italy. Like what? Well, wait a minute, how did the two gentlemen of Verona get from Verona, Italy to Milan, Italy by ship? Traditional say, uh, this is why this proves definitively that it's a Stratford man because Shakespeare gets every single thing wrong. Every single thing wrong. Uh, the Stratford man never went to Italy. He gets everything. He thinks both of these are on the ocean and uh, something, something, something. Um, it turns out our characters used the Northern Italian canals, which were operative during the time that De Vere was there. Uh, long before and long after he left in several Shakespeare plays, not just two gentlemen of Verona, but Taming of the Shrew and many other plays. But also Richard Rowe finds, you know, other important things like actual churches, actual houses, other landmarks. Uh, this isn't just um, uh, major cathedrals, which our traditionalists have, have said, have guessed. These are neighborhood churches, which makes much better sense to our uh, stories here from Shakespeare. Let's go on to the uh, evidence here. Francis Mears writes this book called uh, Palace Tama. And he cites both Edward de Vere and Shakespeare's best play, writes for comedy in one of the paragraphs. And uh, traditionalists have said this proves definitively, beyond question, that these are completely different people. So de Vere is out entirely. Except we're going to talk about this anyway. Today, I'm uh, su summarizing and uh, the insightful work of Dr. Roger Strickmatter, uh, who is a uh, humanities professor at Coppin State University. He's with us today. Uh, he's building on the important foundational work of Dr. Robert Dedabell and Casey Ligon. And Mears receives the same kind of education as Vickers did, and with a master's degree from Oxford University in Greek and Latin. So he, and then he becomes a vicar, and we remember that discussion about Vickers. 
And in the following year, when he does write Paladis Tema, he continues with his conviction that God wants us to use even numbers, he says. And he specifically writes a different paragraph for each literary genre. So in each of these paragraphs, he repeatedly lists ancient writers followed in rank order with English writers. That's important. And then he pairs each ancient writer with some similarity with the corresponding English writer. So there's something similar between the first ancient in each of his paragraphs and the first English writer in that same list. So let's go back to our passage, which contains both Edward de Vere and Shakespeare. This passage contains 16 ancients, but 17 English writers. This is outside of Mir's even numbering scheme. And yes, it turns out there are three other asymmetric paragraphs just like this. Mears makes the other three paragraphs easy to solve. And he, we can see that two names are standing for one writer. So can we solve this with strict matter? To understand Mears' thinking, we need to identify which ancient writer corresponds with Shakespeare. Shakespeare is in the eighth position among English writers. It turns out that Aristonomus is in the eighth position among ancient writers, and this Greek name literally means aristocratic name. Fortunately for us, strict matter has credentials in Greek, but then so do many of our English literature professors also have credentials in Greek. What did they find? Mears' meaning is that Shakespeare is a pseudonym for an aristocrat, and Edward de Vere is the only aristocrat on Mears' list, so he's telling us Edward de Vere's pseudonym is in fact Shakespeare. Mears mentions Shakespeare nine times. And, and this asymmetric paragraph we've been, uh, that we've been talking about is the key to unlocking who he's specifically talking about when he mentions Shakespeare, uh, just like the other three paragraphs work in the same fashion. Now, the question remains, what do our English literature professors have to say? And we have here Don Cameron Allen to give us a hint. Don Cameron Allen was an expert on this book in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. And he was a strident uh, English literature professor. He was an English literature professor at Johns Hopkins University. He says, Mears might even be expressing a hidden, a hidden critical judgment on Shakespeare by arrangement of the names. It sounds exactly like he found what Strickmatter found. Exactly, exactly. So, okay, all right. That's fine. What specifically does he tell us? He doesn't tell us, or he won't tell us, but he does get irritated with the long dead Francis Mears, provided that Mears had a critical purpose in his listings and was not guided by comparative literary genres alone. He's asking, what's his motivation for doing this? What's he doing here? He doesn't, he doesn't come up with a motivation, but you and I know differently. He did have another motivation, he has to be honest. These are Queen Elizabeth's injunctions, meaning rules to her ecclesiastic court. And uh, we remember that uh, she is the supreme governor of the Church of England. So rule number seven, vicars must always do things which pertain to honesty. And in their purity of life, the examples to the people. It's Edward de Vere who is our author. Edward de Vere, knows the complete equality between men and women is so important, and there is more good evidence coming on the way. Thank you.